You know, with it looking more and more likely that the UK is going to leave the European Union, maybe now is an interesting moment to reflect on why Britain ever joined the EEC in the first place and why it was so keen, so desperate to join that it applied no less than three times to get in and why it ratified the treaty that turned the EEC into the European Union. I mean, really, if you want to leave, it does kind of figure that you should know how you ever came to join in the first place. Now, naturally, the game was played for self-interest. It always was. And so post-World War II, the UK had decided that it was special. And it had a pretty good reason for that. It was the only European country not to be invaded in World War II. It was a nuclear power. And it was one of the few nations that had economically grown during World War II. It saw itself as the power broker between the Commonwealth, the United States, and a new united Europe. Great Britain was going to be independent and important. Now, it turns out that Europe's reconstruction was almost as impressively fast as its destruction was. And it led to a very successful financial union between Belgium, France, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and West Germany. Now, at the same time, Britain was struggling. It had nationalized many of its core industries, including health, and that cost a lot of money. Its influence with the United States, as the Cold War highlighted, turned out to be eh, token at best in a world with the USSR and the USA as superpowers. And the trade with the Commonwealth and being on the sidelines of a united Europe wasn't working out so well either. And ironically, it was that very situation that Britain had chosen to create that kept her out of Europe. The French regarded the UK as a Trojan horse that wanted better access to the strong EU trading bloc. So it turned out that Britain really wasn't quite as special as she'd thought. She wasn't as superior at running things as she thought, which led to the UK being the sick man of Europe in the 1970s. And when Britain did finally get into the EEC, it was always seen as the difficult partner. And it's kind of ironic now, after trying so hard to get in, that Britain, which was so much better at running things on her own, now wants to go back where the grass is always greener. Now, if we were talking about sex, all this in-out, in-out thing would be fine. But this isn't sex, and it just looks bloody indecisive to the rest of the world. And honestly, all these promises of Britain will be so much better off on its own. You have huge scope, huge scope for creating vast numbers of new jobs. Outside Europe, we could have prosperity on a level that we can't even imagine now. Escaping fortress Europe could be a new start for Britain. A return at last to the global commercial and trading giant we were in the 19th century should maybe be taken with a little skepticism, as the last time it was tried, it really didn't work out so well. I mean, damn, this is the whole reason why the UK joined the EEC in the first place, because it wasn't working out so well on its own. But maybe this is a sovereign issue. Well, I've got news for you. You live in a monarchy, with a monarch who is appointed by God, not by elections. You cannot vote the monarch out. What really matters is that you should have the power to remove the people who govern you. Indeed, the reason we have a monarch now is because of the first Brexit, which was Henry VIII wanting a divorce from Rome. But they wouldn't give him one, so he decided to get out of Europe and to create his own church, the Church of England, to appoint himself as the head of it. A fantastic piece of moral behaviour, which now means that we have the Queen as the head of the Church of England and defender of the faith. She also is the commander and chief of the army. But oddly, even at that, no one seems to care that she wasn't elected and cannot be voted out. And if you're going to go, oh, but that title's just ceremonial, this is a silly, silly, silly argument. Nah, it's actually like that for a very good reason. You've just got to learn a little from the lessons of history. But I'll leave you to look that up on your own. No one seems to have cared when Britain ratified the treaty that turned the EEC into the EU. With general elections, it doesn't really matter who you vote for, Conservative or Labour, because you know that in four years' time, you can change your mind. 
This time you can't change your mind. This time is for keeps. And there was no referendum needed for it. That's how British democracy works. Because constitutionally, that's how the rules work in our sovereign nation. Now, ironically, most of the arguments against the EU's bureaucracy can be made against the UK's bureaucracy. It's time to regain our freedom and independence. The right to decide ourselves how we live our lives. In the UK, almost all of the laws are actually written by civil servants. They debate their laws in secret. We are not allowed to hear or read their deliberations. Do you know the name of Britain's a European commissioner? Do you know the name of the head of the civil service in England? Have you heard of Jonathan Hill? Have you heard of Sir Simon Macdonald? Did you vote for him? Did you vote for him? No. Did I vote for him? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> nah, he's just another civil servant who's paid about a quarter of a million pounds of your money per year. What you can see everywhere is a conflict between the visions of a rather narrow uh, kind of professional middle class which has dominated European politics and the reaction against it by the larger bulk of the European population. Or maybe it's a bit of a tautology that politicians are good at getting themselves elected. I mean, that's almost how you define a successful politician. But they really don't have that sort of specialised ability to draft new laws. I mean, hell, most of them probably don't even have a decent grasp of the current law. And so maybe, just maybe, it would be best off to leave this process of drafting new laws to some sort of, I don't know, professional middle class, or maybe something like, oh, I don't know, lawyers. In the UK, almost all of the laws are actually written by civil servants, unelected administrators who, just like in Europe, cannot be unelected. We are now subjects of a vastly complex state machine run by anonymous officials whom we didn't elect, but who have the power to impose on us laws that we haven't debated and have no democratic means of repealing. They are even called servants of the crown. Or the argument that we're essentially burning all of this money that we send to Brussels. And all they give us is trinkets in return. I mean, would you really trade in your national identity for cheaper mobile phone calls when you're abroad? It just shows utter contempt for what they pe think people are like because they really do believe that these little trinkets are going to buy us off. Which is kind of like saying that we send all of this money to our government down in London and all they do is give us trinkets in return. When we hear great public institutions, quangos, museums and campaign groups waxing lyrical about the EU, we have to remember the EU gives them vast amounts of our money. Well, yeah, kinda. That's what governments do. They spend your money in a way that is generally seen to be acceptable. Our demands are simple. A small cost of living increase and some better equipment and supplies for your children. Oh, in the dream world, we have a very tight budget to do what she's asking. We'd have to raise taxes. Raise? Oh, way too high as they are now. Taxes is bad. The EU gives shed loads of our money to local authorities and to universities and to art groups and opera companies. It's become a, a very good way of taking money from the general population. And I say taxes are too high! And handing it to people who are lucky enough to be working for the system. You could quite easily argue that we should scrap the NHS. I mean, why should I send all of my money to those inefficient bureaucrats in Westminster so they can spend my own money to establish a national health service when I can just buy the health care that I want with my own money? I mean, we could move towards a wonderful US model of health care. The EU likes to advertise its generosity. Here in the Northeast, for example, European Union investing in your future. Isn't that good of them? I wonder where they got the money. The NHS England. The future means investing in people, patients and communities. Well, isn't that good of them? I wonder where they got the money. Virtually all of the arguments on this front for Brexit seem to be arguments for a smaller government. Ironic, seeing as merely the UK civil service is about half a million people. That's 10 times the size of the EU. And the EU manages one of the largest economic free trade areas in the world. Almost half a billion people with a GDP larger than the United States. 
I mean, I mean, damn, more people work for the tax man alone in the UK than in the entire EU. I mean, really, the entire EU staff is comparable to merely the National Offender Management Services in the UK. So let's be real, if the UK leaves and you want to set up a business, in the EU, you will have direct access to one of the largest markets on the planet, <laughs> or in the UK, where you will have just as much bureaucracy to deal with, but the market is one-tenth of the size. And that's ignoring the fact that Brexit will probably lead to UK end. Because the Scots like Europe, and they're not particularly fond of the English. And the UK leaving Europe will probably lead to Scotland leaving the United Kingdom and joining Europe. And what will probably be sweet, juicy, reciprocal justice, it will be done in a referendum. And I gotta admit, after seeing all this nationalistic chess beating, there's part of me that secretly hopes for it. Because it's got this sort of nationalistic chess beater, natural justice vibe to it. After all, all of this crap was started with a British National Party and the UK Independence Party. What a wonderful piece of natural justice it would be if the UK Independence Party, that's the United Kingdom Independence Party, was the one that actually directly led to the end of the Union. Union Jack? I think they might need to look for another flag. It's kind of restaurant karma, you know. There is no menu. You only get served what you deserve. But in reality, in many ways, the damage is already done even before the vote. This has polarized Britain like nothing else. I mean, shit, when was the last time we had a British politician gunned down in the streets? Well, I'm sure maybe him shouting Britain first wasn't enough. Now he's given his name in court as death to traitors, freedom for Britain. Uh, that if people feel they've lost control completely, and we have lost control of our borders completely as members of the European Union. And if people feel that voting doesn't change anything, then violence is the next step. Yeah, let me guess. Suicide bombers who shout Allah Akbar before blowing themselves up has nothing to do with Islam. And death to traitors, freedom for Britain has nothing to do with Brexit. And oddly, if you look at history, all of the MPs who were killed in the last hundred years or so were done so for nationalism of one sort or another, which is one of the reasons why I always feel deeply uncomfortable when I hear nationalistic rhetoric. Maybe more so given my knowledge of World War II and seeing this sort of thing in my extensive travels in many countries. Win or lose, this issue has already polarized the United Kingdom. And when that split goes right down the middle, it rarely ends well. Bravo, I guess this is the first taste of the inspired leadership that will make Britain great again. Outside Europe, we could have prosperity on a level that we can't even imagine now. Just shows utter contempt for what they pe think people are like because they really do believe that these little trinkets are gonna buy us off.